Friends in Christ, in this season we have heard our Lord's call to struggle with sin, death, and the devil. All that keeps us in this world from loving God. This is a struggle to which we have been called to in baptism. So within this community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving us the peace of reconciliation. So on this night, this holy night, let us confess our sin before God and our neighbors and enter the celebration of these great three days, reconciled with God and with one another. So I ask you to stand. Please take a moment to confess your sin silently before joining with me and your brothers and sisters in Christ in a public confession of your sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will Walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. You have made a public confession and know that God hears you. And because of the revelation of Jesus, know that God forgives you. And on this holiest of nights, Pastor Tim and I will assure each who are worshiping here in person, individually, the forgiveness of their sins. Not because of what we say or what you've done but because of God's grace and mercy.
peace, let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, eleison, eleison. For peace between nations, in the church and the healing of creation, let us pray. Kyrie eleison, Christe. who seek the light, for those who thirst for mercy, and all who long for God, let us pray. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, who are hungry, grieving or in pain, abandoned or afraid, let us pray. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, eleison, eleison. Save, comfort, and defend us, O oh God. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So let us pray. And eternal God, in the sharing of a meal, your Son establish a new covenant for all people. By the power of your Spirit, feed our spirits, refresh our bodies, and breathe new life into us by your mysterious presence through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as Holly shares scripture with us. This is a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper, for when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. And for this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. About the other things, I will give instructions when I come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. is written in the 14th chapter of St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared to eat the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, surely not I. He said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. On that evening, when Jesus gathered his disciples, to celebrate this Passover meal, he was, he was re-entering, remembering, recommitting himself to the covenant God had made with the people of Israel more than a thousand years earlier. 
As Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt ate a hasty meal before gathering their few possessions and fleeing across the desert toward their old homeland, they entered into a new relationship with the God of their fathers. And they discovered in this remarkable saving act that God was even more kind, more forgiving, more steadfast in God's love for them than they had known before. And of course, whenever their Jewish progeny would gather in future generations, they would, as Jesus did, as Jews still do today, they re-enter and remember and recommit to this God who loves and rescues and abides faithfully. The God of Jesus, that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of Moses and Aaron, the God of David and Solomon, the God of Jeremiah, Isaiah, all the prophets, has always, always been a God of covenants. He had always offered generous, one-sided agreements to his people. Heartsick at having destroyed the world by a flood, God set a rainbow in the sky to mark a covenant, a promise that such destruction would never happen again. When God spoke to Abraham and promised to be his God and to give him a land and make him a blessing, God struck another covenant. When God spoke from a burning bush and told Moses to go lead the people out of Egypt, God promised to be fully present. On Sinai, God told people how to respond to the promises already made. God has always been a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. And in that upper room, this desire of God, this yearning of God to be in relationship with God's very people was newly fashioned in the Passover meal as it was shared from Jesus' hands. The new covenant, the new covenant, sealed with the bread, wine, the blood of Jesus, the body broken. It was another effort by God, the God of the universe, to yet again find a way to tell us, show us, move us toward a relationship with God and God's beloved that might result in deeper, fuller life and love. We miss that, I think. Too often, we miss what I have come to believe is the very heart of this ritual that we've learned to celebrate every time we gather on a Sunday for worship and in special days like this. Then that is the notion that this meal is a corporate event. It's a corporate event that marks the desire of God to be connected not only with each one of you, each one of us individually, but, but to us, to us as, us as in a community of beloved human beings. It was, it was never meant to be an individual transaction between God and me or God and you. It was never meant to be, I eat this magical bread and, and drink this magical wine and God forgives me for Jesus' sake. What Jesus intended in that upper room was to offer a meal that reveals the yearning of God to love us and one another and to offer that life to one another. The failure to grasp that was the occasion for Paul's severe words to the church in Corinth. We heard those read a bit earlier. He was angry. I guess Holly's too nice to make it really sound angry, but he was angry. They had apparently come to believe that this meal of remembrance was simply a matter of what benefit it would be to any one of them. What's in it for me? That was the sort of attitude I guess those early believers must have been taking with them to this ritual meal. They were ignoring the needs of their neighbors. Rather than sharing a meal with those who were hungry, the well-fed seemingly ate their own food and then shared bits of bread and wine richly with the rest. And Paul understood that this was a meal 
to make crystal clear God's hope and God's plan for the, for the whole world to be healed and restored and gathered and fed and made new. I think that's the best reason for us to think of what we do this evening as a kind of, of a meal rather than a rehearsal of a sacrifice. Our, our altar and chancel up here it doesn't help much with that perspective, does it? As many worship spaces were designed through the years and centuries, every one in which I've served, the architecture supports this idea of, of sacrifice rather than meal. The altar, it suggests a transaction, a sacrifice given to appease an angry God. And maybe that's not bad, that's not wrong. It certainly conveys the notion that what we do involves a God willing to suffer, to demonstrate unlimited love. But it doesn't help much with the perspective that what we do here is to share a meal together, even though it's just a matter of bits and sips. Think of how you express your hope to deepen your connections or express your love to new or old friends and family. You share a meal, right? Gathered around a table, you eat and drink shared sustenance, time, conversation. You serve each other. Make new friends? You often establish a friendship by having them to your table. Celebrating a life lost. I think the funeral meal at church is as important as the funeral service itself. So what I would ask you to consider tonight is this. You have been invited to God's house for dinner. I know, I know, if, if all we received at this meal was a tasteless little square of something presumably made of wheat, and a drop or two of wine if we don't spill it on the pew in front of us. It would be a meager meal indeed, and we'd run home then to have a proper meal. Our Jewish friends at Passover and, and Shabbat meals, they get this better than we do. There is in those places an understanding that God sets the table. God provides the gifts. God offers a renewal of relationship. Now, I know you can't pretend this is a full meal, but I would ask you to imagine that you've been invited with, with an embossed, fancy invitation on very high-quality paper. It has your name on it. It comes from none other than God. Please, come accept this meal to share with me. It's for you. Please know that, that my affection for you matches my affection for every other person that I've invited to this meal to sit with us. In fact, there is no one, there is not one whom I don't want to eat with us. I'd like you to sit next to me. There's room enough for everyone everyone. That's the invitation. I do have to say that there's one thing about our COVID style of sharing this meal that offers a little bit of a helpful message. It's that we, we eat together. We all eat at the same time rather than coming up to eat each one of us individually. I've always thought that our sisters and brothers in denominations that practice that on a regular basis get a clearer picture of the sense of gatheredness when we eat and drink in our pews. Not that I am any less anxious to come back to our regular style with real bread and a fuller taste of wine. Paul's anger with the Corinthian Christians wasn't that they didn't love God. It wasn't that they didn't gather regularly for worship or had particularly bad theology, but they didn't wait on one another. They didn't wait for one another. They weren't paying attention to the needs of the other. They'd somehow forgotten 
That accepting Jesus' invitation to the meal to remember him was also an invitation to remember the neighbor. It was an invitation to recall that God loves and desires all to be gathered. That all people would be gathered into new and fuller life. It was an invitation to rehearse and to practice hospitality and acceptance that God extends to every human being in this wide world. And it begins, you see, as we embrace one another. It was never a matter of culling the guest list to who we might invite if we had a choice. It was always a matter of finding a way to invite all. So as we share this meal this evening, remembering Jesus in that upper room with his disciples, sharing the same words spoken around the meal ever since those days, we remember God's deep desire to be in relationship with you and me and consider that we have been personally invited by God. God, who is the host of the meal. And we focus anew that God wants us not only to see the people around us who are sharing this meal, but to see the whole world is in need of that same kind of invitation and acceptance. As we do that, please, please remember, you are fully loved. Fully loved. God wants to welcome you. God wants to sit next to you at the table. God hopes that you'll practice the same kind of welcome and embrace of others, even those you might not have put on the invitation list. Amen.
Please stand as we share together our prayers. Lord God, we give you thanks that you invite us to this meal. A meal in which we remember what you have done. We remember all, all of those saving acts through history how you have demonstrated your goodness and your, your faithfulness and your covenant-keeping love. And we remember especially Jesus gathered with his disciples in that upper room. We remember those words that give us life. Broken for you, shed for you. We trust those words words, Lord God, we trust that they are life-giving for us, and we trust that as we receive your very presence with bits of bread and wine and the power of those words, we would be made new, that we would be turned outward to our neighbors, all of our neighbors, those who we would choose and those who we would not choose. Make us new, open our hearts. Open the world to your love and use us as those who open it and share it. For those who have needs of body or soul, gracious God, we lift them to the healing light of your love. You know the ones we hold in our hearts and we, <laughs> we remind you of every day, every, every week, as if you would forget. But we carry them, Lord, so we say their names often. We trust you to hold them, to love them, to make them new. We pray especially tonight for Mike Cochran at the death of his brother, for Gene Limbers, for Paul Blackburn in hospice care. We pray for those who offer themselves in care of those who are at life's end, give them the gifts they need to show your love in whatever way is required. So hold us, Lord, hold us this night as we remember, as we celebrate, as we enter into these holy three days, as we wait with anticipation for Sunday morning. Gratefully, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, hear us as we gather around this holy space behind this altar that's set in the middle of this church, around this meager meal of bread and wine and grape juice and wafer. Help us trust the extraordinary promise you've made with these ordinary things. To meet us in this place and your spirit be with us now. 
For this is the promise that Jesus made. On the night he was betrayed, when he took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we are proclaiming the very mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Keep your promises and meet us here and fill us with your love so that we can fill your world with the love that Jesus' death and resurrection has promised for all of us. Come, Jesus, come. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. those joining us at home, if you've picked up a, a communion kit, I encourage you to sh share now with all of us, as uh, Pastor Tim said, as we eat together. For those of you here, um, struggle with that plastic to get the wafer released from the top. Hold it up when you're ready so I can have an idea that, that some of you have been successful. The body of Christ, given for you. And then take the foil off with them carefully. The blood of Christ, shed for you. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, of your death, and of your resurrection. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us so that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
turn not from his griefs away. Learn of Jesus Christ to pray. See him at the judgment hall, beaten, bound, reviled, arraigned. Oh, the wormwood and the gall, oh, the pangs his soul sustained. Shun not suffering, shame, or loss. Learn of Jesus, bear the cross. Calvary's mournful mountain climb, there adoring at his feet. Mark that miracle of time, God's own sacrifice complete. It is finished, hear him cry, learn of Jesus Christ to die. Early hasten to the tomb, where they laid his breathless clay, all is solitude and gloom. Who has taken him away? Christ is risen, he meets our eyes. Savior, teach us so to rise. Maybe. Seated. As we prepare. Now the festival, the unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. And the chief priests and the scribes looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer me. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One throned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted and you rescued them. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Satan entered Judas, the one called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. And he went away and he conferred with the chief priests and the officers of the temple police about how he might betray Jesus to them. And they were greatly pleased and they agreed to give him money. So he consented and he began to look for an opportunity to betray them when no one, no crowd would be present. Cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and not human, scorned by all and despised by the people. 
All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips, they shake their heads. Trust in the Lord, let the Lord deliver. Let God rescue him, if God so delights in him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Peter said, and Jesus said, Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned your back, strengthen your brothers then. And Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you even know me. You are the one who drew me forth from the womb and kept me safe on my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many young bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed Jesus there. And when he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you might not come into the time of trial. And then Jesus redrew, withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and he prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Open wide their jaws at me like a slashing and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My strength is dried up like the potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And you have laid me in the dust of death. Packs of dogs close me in. The band of evildoers circles round me. They pierce my hands and my feet. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So while Jesus was still speaking to his disciples, a crowd suddenly showed up, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? I can count all my bones while they stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, Lord, be not far away. O oh, my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of wild bulls you have rescued me. I will declare your name to my people. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. 
So then they seized Jesus and they led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all your offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember in turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. And they also blindfolded him and they asked him, prophesy, who is it that just struck you? And they kept heaping other insults upon Jesus. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted. My God, my God, why have you forsaken? 